In New York City, I usually bike or take the subway to get from place to place, but I can also take the bus, walk, or even try one of those rental e-bikes you can unlock with an app. It's the greatest city in the world for a reason. But as soon as I wanna go camping upstate or when I have to travel to Indy for filming or when I'm visiting my parents in Maine, I don't have quite so many options. At some point in the trip, I'm probably gonna have to be in a car. And that's a problem because gas powered cars are the worst. They rely on fossil fuels and put carbon in the atmosphere and we should get rid of them immediately. I know, I know, we can't do that. But we're also not actually doomed to rely on fossil fuels forever to meet our transportation needs. There are plenty of ways we can green up our commutes and give everyone as many options as New Yorkers have for getting around. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen and this is study hall sustainability. These days, a lot of us are pretty reliant on cars to keep up with our busy lives. Lots of US cities are designed with interstate highway systems to move people back and forth from their homes outside the cities to their jobs in them. And as cities grow and spread out, they become less walkable. But since the cities were designed so almost everyone had cars anyway, there hasn't been a lot of incentive to keep expanding public transportation like buses or trains. As of 2021, 45% of Americans didn't have access to public transportation, and even the ones who did might have had old, rundown, and inconvenient systems. And this isn't just a US problem. Head over to countries like New Zealand, Poland, or Canada, and you'll find cars everywhere. When it comes to sustainability and rush hour traffic, that's a problem. The transportation sector alone accounts for about a quarter of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Car exhaust also releases nitrogen oxides, which lowers air quality. Plus, car tires can contribute to microplastics in the ocean, and when not disposed of properly, motor oil can pollute our water with harmful heavy metals like zinc and lead. And that's just the cars. The whole process of building and maintaining the roads that cars drive on also releases a lot of emissions. Each year, the construction materials used in US roads emit up to 13.3 megatons of greenhouse gases. That's as much as a car driving 30 billion miles. But it's not like it's news that cars are bad for the environment. In fact, governments have been looking for ways to curb energy use and reduce pollution in the transport sector for decades. For instance, in 1975, the US Congress passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, which required car manufacturers to make new cars more fuel efficient. The goal was mostly to help Americans conserve energy during a global oil crisis without paying more at the pump, but it had some significant environmental perks. In 1978, cars in the US averaged 20 miles per gallon. By 1985, the average was up to nearly 28 miles per gallon. But oil consumption continued to go up. People were driving more, and they were driving more SUVs that were less efficient. So in 2007, Congress passed the Energy Independence and Security Act, which increased corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE, standards by 40%. This meant cars would go farther on less fuel, which would lower emissions rates and save car owners on fuel costs. Two years later, in 2009, the Obama administration took the CAFE standards from Grande to Venti by increasing fuel efficiency standards even more, to 39 miles per gallon for cars and 30 miles per gallon for light trucks, which includes things like pickup trucks, SUVs, and minivans. And all this legislation has made a big impact. Without eliminating cars, these standards have prevented 14 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions since 1975. That's like if the US just stopped all emissions entirely for almost three years. And that sounds great, but it's still gas cars, and it's still fossil fuels and carbon emissions. So politicians and car manufacturers are coming up with ways to get around without relying on fossil fuels, like electric vehicles. Since they don't directly burn fossil fuels, they aren't pumping more greenhouse gases out of their tailpipes and into the atmosphere. And while they do require electricity to stay charged up and ready to go, EVs on average use 47% less energy than gas cars over the same distance. But there are some downsides to EVs too, like the existence of the Cybertruck. Need I say more? Well, that Cybertruck still needs roads to drive on. Sure, they say it can go off-road, but that remains questionable. And unfortunately, roads used by EVs aren't any less carbon intensive than when they have gas-powered cars on them. And the rechargeable batteries in most EVs run on lithium and cobalt, which is not super earth or human friendly. For example, in Chile, lithium mining uses 65% of the fresh water in the Salar de Atacama region, which is one of the driest deserts in the world. This has also led to water pollution and soil contamination and has depleted the groundwater. And all of this has forced quinoa farmers and llama herders in the area to move away. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, an estimated 40,000 children work in mines, often to extract cobalt in a blatant human rights violation. They're forced to work in highly dangerous conditions to source the cobalt that goes into many EV batteries. There are some alternatives to these mining practices in the works, like direct lithium extraction from California's Salton Sea, which may contain enough lithium to produce over 375 million EV batteries. If it works, extracting lithium from water would take less time and use less water than traditional mining. But so far, this method is untested, and we're not 100% sure what the side effects might be for the environment. And even if we solve the problems of mining lithium, there are other hurdles still standing between people and a shiny new electric car to call their own. First, the sticker price on new EVs is pretty high. In the US, the average 
average cost of an EV is $8,100 more than what you pay for a gas car, even though they're 60% cheaper to actually operate. But some governments have a plan for that too. For instance, the US government offers tax credits for people purchasing EVs. In Norway, EV owners get tax breaks plus additional perks like lower toll fees. This incentive system has made Norway a leader in EVs. About a quarter of the cars on the road there are fully electric. But even if cost isn't a deal breaker, range anxiety can be. That's the fear that you'll run out of battery power and get stranded on the side of the road, where you'll be eaten by wolves, die of exposure, or get kidnapped by a serial killer cruising the highways in search of his next victim. While that's pretty unlikely, it is true that in the US there are more than twice as many gas stations as public EV charging stations. But between 2020 and 2023, the number of charging stations in the US more than doubled, and the US Department of Transportation is working to help rural communities boost their EV infrastructure too. That way, more people can drive EVs without having to deal with range anxiety, or hungry wolves. Even with all those plans in place to improve EVs, there's still cars and cyber trucks, which as I've mentioned, are the worst. So if we really wanna move around more sustainably, we might need a little less focus on EV infrastructure and a little more focus on public transportation infrastructure. That way everyone has the option to ditch their car and hop on a subway the way we do in New York City. And even though New York City is the greatest city in the world, it's not the only place with transportation options. Tokyo is full of gorgeous shrines, fantastic gardens, and delicious food. Pedestrians and bikers flood through Tokyo's public spaces to take in the sights, sounds, and snacks. Something you're less likely to see though is cars. And that's not just because it's easier to enjoy yakitori on foot than behind the wheel, Tokyo city planners made sure that people could live in Tokyo without needing a car in the first place. Neighborhoods are a mix of homes and small businesses, which means most people can find everything they need just around the corner. For folks who need to travel across town, Tokyo offers transit options like buses, trams, and a monorail. And if people need to travel further still, Tokyo has one of the world's most extensive urban rail networks of trains and subways. These railway lines cover more than 1,200 miles of track and link to over 1,500 stations. Public transportation like trains and buses do still contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, but trains can be electric and even run on renewable energy. And because public transport can haul more people, it cuts down on the overall emissions it takes to move those folks from place to place. To put it in perspective, say you're traveling from Tokyo to Osaka, a distance of around 300 miles. If you were driving a gas-powered Toyota Camry, which gets about 39 miles per gallon on the highway, you'd emit over 120 kilograms of carbon dioxide. That's about 30 times more emissions than taking Japan's bullet train. But we all can't live in the Utah of rolling hills, fresh sushi, Studio Ghibli, and reliable and accessible public transport. Luckily, many US cities are working to increase transportation diversity. By investing money in public transit and infrastructure like sidewalks and bike lanes, cities can make it much easier for residents to hang up their car keys, at least part of the time. And having multiple transportation options isn't just better for the environment, it can also make our communities more equitable. Like in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, city officials have worked to make bus stops more accessible, especially for people who commute to work in the city's industrial district. And Seattle has a transit to trail program. It increases bus service to help residents reach places outside the city limits. Unfortunately, redesigning cities to undo 100 years of car-centric urban planning and doing so sustainably takes time. But in the meantime, there are other ways to make a car-dependent country like the US more sustainable. Many large cities encourage carpooling by promoting high occupancy vehicle lanes and providing subsidized parking rates for ride sharers. Turning our single cars into mini mass transit is a way to limit emissions and make cars slightly less terrible. At the end of the day, we need to get around. We need to get to school and work and to the restaurant across town and out of the city to go camping or visit family in Maine. And the fact that so many of our cities weren't built to accommodate walking, biking, or public transit is unfortunate. Lots of us will still need to rely on cars for the foreseeable future. So we need more and more governments and cities and people to get on board with having more walkable cities, better public transportation, more electric vehicles, and fewer gas-guzzling cars. That way, we'll be able to get more people where they need to go without the environment paying the price. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your craziest public transportation story, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.